second. So hi everyone, thank you for making out today to the Student Wellness Organization panel. My name is Reginald Hughes and I will be your host for today's session. Um, we have a couple of moderators in this session. Um, you will see that they have moderator next to the name and then if you can go ahead and introduce yourself real quick before we get started on our main event. Oh, moderators wanna like wave or raise their hand or say hi. Oh. Oh. Hi, um, I'm doubling as a moderator, but I'm, my name is Vicente Velasco. It's nice to meet you. Hello, I am Carlos Figueroa. I am also one of the moderators for this event. Sorry, I'm going to have my video off. I'm sort of like uh, my lunch, weird lunch period, but I am moderating and I am listening to everything. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm the third moderator for this session. Yes. Okay, I'm Lisa. I'm the other moderator. Nice to meet you. Hi, my name's Francis. I'm also a moderator and my video is off just because my cats are running around everywhere and you could probably hear them in the background, but I'm also paying attention. Okay, and then for each org, we're just going to go through um, introductions. I'm just going to list the names orgs, and if we can have one person representing your org um, say that name. If you have multiple people, um, can you please um, delegate which person is going to be talking for introductions? And if we can keep it to one minute, that'll be great, so we can answer more questions at the end. So can Bruin Necessities introduce themselves? Hi, my name is Beatrice and I'm, I'm oh sorry, sorry, I'm Danielle. <laughs> yeah, and we're both co-directors of Brew Necessities. So as part of the Student Wellness Commission, Brew Necessities Committee supports UCLA by raising awareness to basic needs resources that are available on campus. So BN was founded in 2017 to address two different needs on campuses on campus, which are the lack of free menstrual products and dental screenings. And so since then we've worked towards offering free menstrual hygiene products and dental screenings and more at UCLA. So our purpose is not to portray ourselves as the sole organization that addresses basic needs, but to support and advocate for the many organizations that address basic needs on campus who have existed before BN. So because BN has many different parts, we have different committees to focus on specific issues or aspects of BN. So there are six general committees um, and they are menstrual hygiene, dental hygiene, external affairs, staff dev, um, publicity and finance. So as part of BN, you'll join a committee and work with other members during meetings to plan events uh, that are related to the mission of your committee. And so because we're transitioning online, we're still trying to connect to the UCLA campus by passing out basic needs kits with our collaboration with the Facilities Commission, which is un also under USAC, and with online panels. So if you're interested in helping us out with these events, or if there's a specific event that you want us to host, um, just let us know. Great, thank you. Brown Consent Coalition. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Martin Him His. Um, I'm co director for Brown Consent Coalition, um, formerly known as 7,000 um, Solidarity, um, which was formed in 2013. And just as a content warning, um, our organization is about sexual assault. So I'll just give you all a few seconds if you guys want to like just turn off your camera or anything that sort, just because like it will have to talk about sexual assault and everything. Um, but yeah, so um, within our organization, like our efforts are to create more inclusive campus um, where folks and well, we're victims and survivors and just like allies can learn more about sexual assault itself, just so we could promote more safety and more um, brave spaces. Um, and our ultimate goal is to eliminate sexual assault on campus and just like throughout different um, communities itself. But it is going to take a lot of community effort to do so and a lot of um, education to do that as well. Um, so our efforts this year um, is to create a more um, inclusive online access where folks can like be able to like discuss things that they want to discuss like because I know like for online right now like some folks may be in environments where they have experienced assault themselves. So that's where it might be a little bit um, dangerous for them to not be like able to communicate their emotions or just like their trauma with us or just like create a space where they could just talk about anything with us. So that's something we're really focusing on this year. Um, we have different um, subcommittees within our organization. Um, we're still um, trying to find different directors for certain um, programs within our organization, but we're more than open to like different um, event ideas or anything. Like we're going to create a feedback form that's going to be live throughout the year. So if y'all have any like um, events that you want to see us to do or any sort of like 
um, general focus you want us to like um, create more spotlight on, um, feel free to like let us know. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Bruin Run slash Walk. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm here representing Bruin Run Walk, and Bruin Run Walk is also part of SWC, like the other committees that just spoke. And basically, what we do is we plan a 5K that normally occurs in the spring, um, supporting our beneficiary, which we're in the process of changing right now, but it's usually like children's health centric. Um, so that's what we're going to kind of try to keep it on. And um, just to give you guys kind of an idea, last year our theme was Come Run Walk Here on the Western Frontier. And we raised over like $40,000 to support our beneficiary, which was super awesome. And yeah, we have different subcommittees that people can join, um, donations, participants, and events. And yeah, we also just kind of support the other SWC committees because we only have kind of one event that we like work towards. Um, but yeah. Thank you, CPR first CPR slash first aid. Hi guys, I'm Andrea. I'm one of the co-directors of CPR. Um, I'm Carlin, and I'm the other co-director. So our org is basically a group of volunteer undergraduate CPR first aid and BLS instructors. So as a part of our org, you'll actually be instructing CPR first aid and BLS classes, which we host Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays during non-pandemic times. So we have plans for the fall, but. Um, they're a little altered due to the pandemic. But basically, um, a couple issues our org seeks to address is, one, the non-prioritization of community care. So we talk a lot about self-care, but what about our community care? And two, financial barriers to this knowledge, because typically CPR, first aid and BLS classes can be a bit expensive. So in order to address community care, um, what we want to do is, in, you know, build a system that's founded on mutual aid within our UCLA community. Um, so that community members and not just healthcare professionals are responsible for the well-being of others. So together we can drastically reduce the number of pre-hospital deaths due to cardiac arrest or any other um, potential, you know, life-threatening illness, disease, um, accident. And secondly, in order to encourage community accountability, we like to keep our classes as low cost as possible. So I mentioned that our like classes can usually be fifty to one hundred dollars, depending on the class you're taking. But for UCLA students, we offer it for only ten dollars. So as a part of our org, you'll help you know accomplish these two goals that we have and join our CPR family. Thank you, Earth. Do we have a representative from Earth? Okay, if they come in later, I'll call on them. But our next representative, H and F. H and F going once. Okay, sex birds. Hi, uh, my name is Elsa and I am one of the co-directors this year for Sexperts, which is an SWC commission. Um, so we are focused on basically take, talking about all things sex, destroying taboos that are on our campus, but also increasing access um, and awareness to sexual health um, and education. The idea being that a lot of students coming in from all over the country and all over the world are coming in with a huge variety of different backgrounds of experiences and understanding when it comes to communicating their sexual needs, understanding um, how to navigate sexual health care, consent and relationship communication. So we focus a lot more, um, uh, focus on a lot more than just the birds and the bees. Um, and we talk about pretty much everything that is related to your sexual health and your relationship health. Um, so online this year, we're going to be doing basically just a lot of online workshops um, to try to keep people connected. We have a really nice um, social atmosphere where uh, you can talk about truly anything that, um, that's, I guess, speaks to you in this department. Um, and we're also going to be working on how you can navigate um, your sexual health and understand sexual wellness in this pandemic, these pandemic times. Um, and uh, just uh, coming to college, um, how you can do that online and still have fun and enjoy yourself and be safe. Thank you, AFGU. Um, 
Hi, so I'm Caitlin. I am the Health and Wellness Director for AFGU. If you're all wondering, that is an acronym which stands for the Association of First Generation Undergraduates at UCLA. Um, it was founded quite like a year ago in 2019, so it's fairly new, but it is a community for first generation students and we give them resources and of course, workshops that help facilitate their transition into UCLA, especially for our transfer students here. We do have a new component specifically for transfers and we hope to offer our services and resources that we have for our normal students to the transfer community. So other things we do offer is we just offer safe space for our first generation students here where we can express ourselves and interact with people within our group. And of course, we're here to encourage student involvement and promote service activities within our community here. Um, in terms of wellness, we do have workshops as a health and wellness director. I am holding these workshops and how you guys can get involved is coming into these workshops as well coming into our overall meetings that we do have for AFGU. Thank you. Total Wellness. Hi, um, I'm Amy. I'm one of the co-directors for Total Wellness. Oh, hi, I'm Elaine. I'm also one of the directors for Total Wellness. I didn't realize that I was muted before, but um, all right. So Total Wellness is a magazine publication. Um, we create content around various aspects of mental and physical health. We want to make health resources and education more accessible to UCLA students. So we produce three print magazines yearly, and we also have an online presence through our website and social media platforms. And we also put on programs, so fairs, workshops, and other activities like that. So everything we do centers on giving students the tools to take charge of their own health, you know, whether it be healthy recipes, um, easy exercises to do at home, or, you know, focusing on mental health and de-stressing because, you know, students are really busy. They may be overworked. Um, they may be sacrificing sleep to make up for that. Um, so we really want to support students' uh, wellness in a holistic manner and, again, give people the tools to create a healthier lifestyle for themselves. And some ways to get involved, um, we are recruiting for fall 2020. Uh, we're recruiting for writing, design, uh, digital media, which none of which require any prior experience, as well as programming and marketing if you guys are interested in um, event planning, outreach, and things like that. Thank you. Body Image Task Force. Hi, I'm Lorena. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, I'm one of the co-directors for Body Image Task Force. My camera's off just because my cat is also running around and he's really distracting. Um, but we are an organization under SWC, like a lot of the other committees are. Um, we focus on body image issues, how it affects your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health, and all the intersections it has with things like race, gender, sexual orientation. So we put on a lot of different events ranging from giving resources to educating the student body about body image issues. And we are recruiting for fall. Our application will come out week zero and you can find it on our Instagram or the SWC website. Thank you. And then for our last representative, do we have Search, a representative for Search? Hi, my name is Kavya, and I'm one of the co-directors for SWC Search, which stands for Student Education and Research on Contemporary Health. Our name basically um, says it all. We're focused on providing like research and health specifically geared toward UCLA students. Um, currently, our biggest project right now is we're working in conjunction with a professor from the UCLA Public School of Health to evaluate the different SWC programs and see what types of programs and what are the different factors that make these different SWC programs like most effective for UCLA students. In addition to that, we have our blog with which we post different posts regarding mental, um, social, and like physical health. And each quarter we try to focus on one of those different aspects of health and have like a few events to promote that throughout the um, UCLA campus. 
Thank you everyone for giving a little bit of introduction about your respective orgs. And then now we're gonna turn it over to starting our panel and asking a few questions before we get to our pre-survey question, pre-survey questions that we collected from our pre-registration surveys. So if everyone can just answer briefly about um, the question I'm asking so we can get through all of them in a timely manner so we won't go over the hour mark. So the first question I have for you is what does wellness mean to you and what do you see with student wellness at UCLA or what issues do you see with student wellness at UCLA? So again, anyone can jump in and talk. Um, I could get started. It's just a little hard to pick up online if like social cues if, if anyone has anything to say. But um, in regards to like issues with student wellness at UCLA right now, obviously there's a lot of mental health issues that are circulating just with everyone being forced online and, um, you know, and dealing with the social isolation. Um, and what I can't stress enough, though, is how many resources that there are that exist outside um, or, or that, like, that do exist um, that can help with that. Like uh, so many of the committees that have been mentioned specifically do um, work exactly with that for my organization specifically in terms of like relationship issues um, and dating and things like that. Um, there have been a lot of different uh, possibilities for people um, moving online. And I think what, it, what, it, what has been inspiring the most um, is just like the silliness that I see in my Zoom classes that um, I want to at least let the people know that are like transfer students that are coming in um, of that you will still make friends and people still here are incredibly friendly and everyone is trying their absolute hardest um, that despite being online to create a new sense of community that exists elsewhere. Do you have someone else that wants to chime in on that question? Um, what does wellness mean to you and what other um, issues do you see with student wellness at UCLA? Um, if no one's gonna go, I'll just chime in with that one too. So I definitely agree with Elsa. Is that how you say your name? I don't want to butcher it. But definitely, yeah, there's a lot of a mental um, issues because it is difficult. It's a difficult time with isolation and whatnot. But I also want to point out there's a lot of physical wellness that we're not we're missing out here since everyone is forced in line, forced to be inside, quarantine. There's also this likeliness for us to you know lay around in bed and not move around much. And of course, physical wellness can affect your mental wellness as well. Since to me, wellness is being well rounded. Um, as students, we all understand being well rounded in terms of academics, research, and whatnot. Not, but that also plays in time with our wellness in terms of our physical, emotional, and mental wellness. So. Yeah, um, I can chime in to answer that question too. Sorry, I'm in the car. Well, so um, kind of like I mean, too. Um... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. I think my connection's just bad. <laughs> Anyways, um, I guess like for health, I feel like there are so many different aspects of health. Like sometimes people usually think of like physical health, that's like the first thing they think of when it comes to health. But since there are so many aspects of health, um, that's why we have so many committees to cover the different components of health. And um, it's important to take care of all of them. There's like emotional health, financial health, physical health, mental health. And I think um, especially during quarantine, a lot of people have to deal with like the changes and adapt to um, different a different way of living, which is why like it's really important to take care of that mental aspect, physical aspect as well. And yeah, I was just just saying like I think a big thing is especially at UCLA is the fact that many students um, don't prioritize their health and often don't see it as an issue and. People often like do these things to like make their health better once it's already at a point when it's like really bad. So I think the important thing is to like just kind of like maintain health like generally and like always have it as a priority. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is true. We're like just so focused on academics where we put like our health, whether it be like sleeping, eating, getting the proper like nutrition. So I think that's definitely important. Like there's other aspects of health than just physical health. So um, I think to help like this panel go smoother, I think we can raise our hand and then I can call on you guys so we won't have like talking over each other. And then does anyone else from our panelists want to chime in on that answer or that question? Okay, well, I can move on to the next question. Why does your organization support wellness in that way? And what does it hope to accomplish? So again, if we can raise our hands and then I can call on you guys one by one. Do we have any volunteers? Perfect. Lorena? Yeah, so we... Oh, we support um, wellness by giving resources and talking about body image issues really openly and creating a safe space for students. And it's really important for us to do that because a lot of students and most students deal with body image issues or they know someone who has, but it's not something that people usually talk about. So by providing resources and giving a safe space, it's bringing about a conversation and hopefully positively impacting students so they can take that information and talk to their friends about it and just continue spreading. Thank you. Carolyn, did I pronounce that right? You're muted, just so you know. Oh, Carolyn, did I pronounce that right? Hey, it keeps muting me. Okay, wait, I think it's good now. Okay, I am so sorry. You're good. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah, so the way our organization, you know, kind of addresses these is that I kind of spoke on it earlier. I think a lot of times, you know, people place the responsibility of health within the individual, and to some degree that is true, right? But at the time, it doesn't have to be that way. And when we look more toward our community members and make sure, you know, we can lean on other people who are also in this space, um, we can help each other out a lot better. Um, so kind of practicing a model of interdependence as opposed to individual focused health. And that's kind of a core pillar of wellness, at least as far as um, CPR and first aid, you know, goes, because a lot of time it's literally about, you know, preparing yourself to help someone else. It's not about helping yourself and focusing on, you know, getting yourself better, but it's really preparing yourself in order to help others. And, you know, to go beyond the UCLA community, we also want to make sure this happens, you know, in the greater Los Angeles area, because there are communities who also aren't getting this information. So a lot, a big part of our org, our public health initiatives, when we go out and spread this information, obviously, like being conscious of, you know, the space that we take up in those communities and making sure like it is just, um, a very open space of sharing information and empowering those communities as opposed to like, you know, a power dynamic of we have information you don't. So also being conscious of that. But yeah. Thank you for that answer. Um, and then next was Amy. Um, yeah, so since Total Wellness is a magazine organization, um, we try to produce content to break down like information about health and wellness since there's so much out there that's just like bombarding us with like different things like people some people say like keto diet some people are like no and so we try to like make that really simple for um the ucla students to understand and we get all our content peer reviewed by professionals and also we just try to use social media to um show more different aspects of health to people because not everybody may know about the importance of sexual health or not everybody would know the importance of like body image and body positivity so we try to produce an array of content on our social media and our magazines so that as people look through they learn something new 
Great, thank you. And then our last hand raised was Elsa. Yeah, um, so when we're navigating um, relationships and sex and intimacy, um, when in terms of like through the lens of wellness, you can look at education and then you can look at how you put that education into practice. Um, and so we definitely try to tackle both ends um, of that, of giving people the tools and the resources to understand um, everything about themselves and how they work and tools of like, where can I go, you know, if I need this resource specifically um, and providing those resources when um, and if we can, but then also in practice of um, giving people workshops of how do you actually have these difficult conversations now that you know that you should have them now that you know what you should say or the information you should acquire in reality. Um, you know, real life and, and relating to people is very difficult and definitely can lead to a lot of anxiety or insecurity for people. Um, and just at the end of the day, no one is perfect at it. Um, and so if we can provide the, the space to have those conversations to practice so that when you go out in the real world and, and you ask for those things, you know, you set your boundaries um, um, and you ask for what you want, you can do it confidently and you know you can do it safely, learn how to advocate for yourself um, and have a better experience overall. Great, thank you for you guys' responses. Do we have any other panelists who would like to answer that last question? Again, it was, why does your organization support wellness in that way and what does it hope to accomplish? Going once, going twice. Okay, so for our next set of questions, these are questions that we collected from our pre-survey questions. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just um, ask the questions. Please feel free any organizations to chime in and also participants, if you wanna add um, additional information, you are so welcome to add it in the chat as we love student engagement from both sides. So the first question that I have for you all is, how do you balance academics and stay sane during online classes and living at home? And again, you can raise your hand and then I'll call on you. Amy? Hi, yeah, um, I think it's definitely important to set the boundaries between school and just playtime. I know that seems pretty obvious, but um, people go about it in different ways. Some people like study in a different area. Um, for me personally, I, I don't know if any, I think it depends on how well or how you manage your time, but um, I think it's important to just like set aside the time to just not focus on schoolwork at all. So for me, like the weekends, I just don't even think, I try not to think or work and I think it helps burn out. Um, and so it's just important to always set aside that time. Yeah, that's good. Sometimes like now that everything is online, like our academics are entering kind of like more into our personal and private life so it's good to set those like barriers and like those boundaries of like when is work when is school when is my private time when is self-care time so yeah and then next elsa um, i think in another important thing to look at besides just like what you can physically do of you know how do you separate your space how do you maintain those boundaries um, is also to take a really hard look at what this education means to you uh, you know and what you're looking to get out of it because i think that, you know at the end of the day if you, you have to have that motivation going strong constantly um, because at this point it's sort of like a sheer force of will if you can just get through this um, and i'm sure you will learn a lot about yourself and how you handle those things um, and it will be a really excellent skill to develop. That being said, it's still difficult. Um, and so I think if you go through it very intentionally, setting out of like, this is exactly what I wish to accomplish with myself, or at least what I wish to try to accomplish and what I wish to learn from it, um, I think you can be a little bit more successful because the burnout is very real. Yes, Caitlin. 
Um, so I love the ideas of boundaries. I think that's really helpful. But in addition to that, I think what makes it different from being at home and being at school is that set schedule. Um, so, you know, being at school, we do have classes that, you know, we have attendance for. And so we're going to class and that sets a schedule for us. Being at home, having everything pre-recorded, you're like, I can just watch that later. But by doing that, you're setting it off. And then, you know, you go into that really unproductive state. So I think what's really effective, especially with sleep as well, since sleep does contribute to your schedule. If you set out a time when you should sleep, when you should wake up within an hour frame. And of course, if you have pre-recorded lectures, set out a time to watch those lectures every week. Um, that would really help. Great, thank you. And then our next question that we have for all of you is, how does the average UCLA student school life balance look like and how can we prepare for it? Kavya, did I pronounce it right? Kavya, but like, yeah, Kavya. Remember, yeah. I will get it right. <laughs> so for me, at least like the biggest thing would definitely be like scheduling blocks of time, like for like free time and everything. I think like we often forget about that. So it's really important to like actually like physically schedule it. And I think that's a great way because especially like at UCLA, you're constantly having stuff to do and you're around people also who are also doing stuff so I think it's important also like to like kind of like realize that even like seeing everybody else do stuff like you have to take things at your own pace and that's really important. And then do we have another panelist that wants to shed a, shed a little light on like school life and work balance? Haley? Hi, yeah, I think it's also important to like remember that each quarter is gonna be different and every like your person's schedule is always so different. So you kind of have to like at the beginning of each quarter when things change, kind of reevaluate how you're gonna use your time and like what time, how much free time you do have and like not over schedule yourself. So you're spreading yourself too thin and then um, take it from there. like each time and I think that that works the best um, kind of like reevaluating it every like now and again when you can and yeah and then our next question is oh we have one from Danielle and Beatrice yeah hi um I can take this question so like last year I was actually a commuter so um I know firsthand how it feels like to juggle both extracurriculars and classes and with a horrible like driving schedule. But I think what really helped me was to just think about like what I'm doing today and how it'll help my future in the long run. Cause sometimes it may feel like overwhelming to have to deal with like all these classes and extracurriculars and you just kind of want to quit all of it. But you just think about how what you're doing right now will benefit you as like, not only like your resume, but also you as a person and your ability to juggle all these like difficulties and then yeah <laughs> yes thank you for mentioning commuters we do have a population of commuters and i'm sure this information will be super helpful for them and then andrea hi uh, so i just want to chime in and say in terms of like extracurriculars and things like that what i find super useful for that is just making sure that you're involving yourself in extracurriculars that you are passionate about and that you actually want to take a part in versus something that you may be doing for other reasons just because when you do something like that then it's starting to feel a little bit less like work and you really enjoy yourself and then you're also building these support networks with other people who can support you when maybe it's getting a little bit harder to like do work, things like that, you always have that support network to lean on. So that's something that I've found super useful, just making sure that you love the projects that you're involved in, and then you'll be having a great time while you're doing them. Great, great. And then moving on to our next question, how can you stay fit slash exercise at UCLA with everything being remote? Does UCLA offer any virtual exercise programs of if any fifth if any of our panelists have any information on that, that'll be super great. Uh, 
Um, I can talk about that. So I think, um, you know, staying fit is obviously, you know, something that we all want to do. It's part of the whole work-life balance thing. Um, so typically there are gyms that are open, um, but they're not because of the pandemic. Um, but that's totally fine because obviously like UCLA has like a really nice campus. So a lot of times students, if you want to go for a run, um, you can run the perimeter of campus. It's about a four mile run and it has a lot of hills so you can like practice training. Um, so that's kind of a good way. And even just running through campus, there's lots of stairs, lots of um, just hills that you can just like run up. So that's usually a fun way to stay fit. Um, and I think also like, you know, within wherever like you're living, like within, for example, like your apartment or your, um, oh yeah, someone mentioned UCLA Rec does have like online classes. They, yeah, they're having online classes too. So they have like Facebook Lives, Zooms, and you just have to register on um, like the UCLA Rec website. But even what I found too is like within my own apartment, like we do work out together. So we'll like go to like a secluded spot on campus and, um, and we'll just, you know, pull up a video or pull up a workout beforehand and just do that together. So um, there are plenty of ways to kind of get moving, get active, but definitely if anyone else has, can chime in for sure. Danielle and Beatrice. Yeah, hi. Um, in addition to UCLA Rec, I know also there's another org on campus called um, Fitted under CPO, and they also host um, online uh, workout classes that you can join through Zoom, as well as cooking classes, um, because back when we were on campus, they also hosted cooking classes and workout classes. Um, so yeah, they're CPO fitted, and then um, there's a bunch of organizations on campus that post um, health-related, wellness-related um, content on their social media. Yeah. Great, and then Andrea, and then after Andrea, we'll have Elsa. Oh, I just wanted to mention the UCLA rec classes, but someone else brought it up. Yeah, me too. Uh, it was just Fitwell um, as a website, they do like a group pass. that they, they did a discounting rate last spring, and I think it was like 40 something dollars for an unlimited quarter of like however many classes you wanted to take. And then for our next question, how did you guys all deal with negative self-talk whenever it came up? Elsa? Personally, I find the most support in my peers. I'm a very social person. Um, and I think a lot of uh, I've, I've really never met um, a UCLA student who is just super lacking in the empathy department and just couldn't help me when I was struggling. Um, and I think a lot of, like so many of your peers have experienced this and are going through this at the same time as you, sort of albeit just on adjacent paths. Um, and so I really think it just comes to reach out to people and they will be there for you or they will help you. Carolyn? Yeah, totally just to piggyback off what Elsa said, like leaning on, um, you know, your peers to help you. I think a lot of the time students, but particularly like students of color, any kind of like um, minority identity um, can tend to feel imposter phenomenon a lot more. And I think we all do it, but Elsa really hit the nail on the head with that it's like really you know talking about it and not just like internalizing it because when you talk about it you can really you know have other people tell you you know this is not your imposter phenomenon it's very it happens with everyone but it's obviously like not the case um so it really helps you kind of ease that negative self-talk and start implementing practices of speaking better to yourself. I think that's something I've had to learn too, is like not telling like, oh, you're so stupid for doing this. Like, no, like constantly rep reprimanding myself when I do that and catching that and catching it when other people talk negatively to themselves too. So kind of that, again, that interdependent network of helping us all be a lot more positive to ourselves. Great, great. And then one question that we have specifically directed for the Brewing Consent Coalition is, what does consent look like, consent look like in an online platform when you're trying to date online? And how can I better advocate for myself? 
And please, if other panelists do have information, we would love to also hear it, or you can type it in the chat. So similarly, how it is like in person, like if you're like meeting up with someone, like you would of course like ask them like, oh, is it okay if I do this or is it okay if I do this? So and so, um, that's how it'd be like virtually online as well. Um, but I know that's not accessible towards everyone because I know some folks may not be able to like um, do certain things and something of that sort. So that's where um, you could like even just like write in the chat or just like, it's just like communication, um, honestly. Um, and through Zoom, um, from folks I've heard already who are testing out like online dating, um, it's the same thing like, oh, ask if you want to talk a certain way, like if it's like in a sexual way, like, oh, like, is it okay if we talk like this? Don't just assume like, oh, okay, since it's online, like they're not gonna really care. Um, we could just do whatever you want because that's not how it is at all. Um, it'll be like just respecting like if you're seeing them in person. Um, and yeah, so it's just like about knowing like your boundaries, just like just asking them like, oh, okay, is it okay if we talk about this or is it okay if I do this? Um, and like, even like with that, like, even if you feel a bit awkward at being online, I feel like that's where you just need to like push your boundary in the sense of like getting to know like their comfort level as well as recognizing your own like, oh, okay, is this something I really wanna do? Or just something that I feel comfortable doing it in the first place? Um, and I just feel like it's important to recognize like how it would be like in person. Cause again, you shouldn't assume just because it's online it doesn't mean that it's going to be okay and everything to like um, send pictures or to like ask them to do something or like you doing something in front of the camera for them like without even asking like oh it's okay if I do this. Um, again it just has to do with communication and also like knowing their body language um, and that might be difficult like let's say if their camera isn't working or anything that's where you kind of just have to ask them like oh like are you comfortable like stopping midway or something of that sort. Great, thank you. And then Elsa? Um, yeah, so I've talked a lot about this in sex for a while. And I think what you, a good thing to do is to really see this online dating and everything as an opportunity to practice safely um, how to assert your boundaries and how to communicate consent effectively. Because I think as a culture in general, at least on college campuses, we're very aware of like the no means no at this point, but I don't think our consent conversation usually ever sort of transcends above that in an everyday sense. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really understand that consent is almost like a spectrum. Like it's not, it's not just like a, you know, yes sort of thing, like let's do this right now, or like, ah, I don't know, like there's, there's a variety of different ways that people can express that they want to do something. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times it's really troubling when people sort of tend towards the like scarier end of the spectrum of like look for being like really focusing on those maybes instead of like obtaining enthusiastic consent. That's sort of a different conversation. But but just by being a college student in this culture, you're already forced to sort of participate in this system um, where a lot of people just don't have this information and they or they don't really look for consent. There's there's so many um, difficulties of navigating those conversations. But what you can do as an individual now, and especially in being online, is you can practice. And you can practice cutting people off. You can practice saying no when you get uncomfortable. You can practice just taking a step back and really thinking for yourself, is this what I want? Because you are in the comfort of your own home uh, and in the comfort of your own space. Um, and I think that that is an incredibly invaluable lesson to learn. Um, and it will do wonders for you going forward if you can advocate for yourself and you can learn that at the end of the day, it's just about you. You know, if, if you can advocate for yourself and take care of yourself, you come first um, and no one ever is going to change that for you. So I included in the chat here, I put two different therapists that I really like that are like relationship counselors. Um, on Instagram, but they post a lot of educational content of like, how do you actually do this? You know, what words do you use? Um, and if anyone ever has questions about this, you can also reach out to the Sexperts um, Instagram, or you can send us an email directly. And I or my co-directors or one of my staff will answer your questions and we'll have conversations with you. I get questions all the time of like, but what actually do I say? Um, and I can totally talk about that with you, no problem. Um, but the biggest thing is see this as an opportunity um, to finally feel like to, to take your power back and to feel safe here. And then um, to really add on to that, um, 
of course, like, if you do give consent, um, you could always take it back. And that's something people always fail to realize that, okay, once I give consent, like, it's not like a signed something or anything that's where, like, you could always take it back, like, oh, I'm not comfortable, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and, yeah, like, it's you own your own body, no one else can tell you otherwise. Um, but I know, like, sometimes you are in, like, a dangerous, like, um, circumstances and all that, but always recognize that you could always take back your consent um, that you gave. Yeah, um, so I think, uh, like, a final thing to remember, um, especially, like, with that vein, is that consent is ongoing. Like, if you keep updating with it, it's reversible, which is exactly what you just talked about. You can say no at any time. You can say, just kidding, I changed my mind. I know I said it 10 seconds ago that I wanted to do that, but I actually don't feel comfortable with that. Um, it's enthusiastic. I think it's a whole lot harder to be with someone who's like, yes, let's do this right now, instead of, like, eh, have a headache. Um, like that's, that's not consent. Consent is yes, I want to do this. Um, and I think that that's a really important part. The reversibility of it is, is essential. Great. Thank you. And then just one final question that I have for all of you panelists. What do you think a student should always be aware of before they begin their journey at UCLA? And this question is particularly directed for our incoming transfer population. Elsa? I think, um, I think for this one, I would say, I know that it's intimidating coming into a really big school um, and especially coming in as a transfer, you know, like a lot of people sort of come in as freshmen and then they get this like really exciting to go out and make friends and make like connections and things like that. Um, and I know that it's easy to feel as a transfer that your time is more limited. Um, you know, and that, that so the, the size of the place is even more overwhelming because you have to do so much more in so much less time. Um, but that being said, it, it actually, in reality, it doesn't really exist like that. You will find your niche. Um, and I think that, that that time pressure on you, um, how you could debate sort of how real that is, but it really is what you make of it. And, and I'm sure that you will find people who will also be in the same boat with similar interests. Um, and you will totally find your people here despite it being so big. Great, Amy. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And um, I think like it is definitely important to think like take your time and not pressure yourself to do something at like a certain pace because you have expectations for yourself. Um, but also, I think it's also great to join as many orgs as you want because I think um, a lot of times people join college and they think, oh, I'm not sure if I want to do this. And they get scared or like, oh, I'm not sure if this is right for me. But honestly, you can join orgs and leave them if you don't like them. And so it doesn't hurt to like try new things and try finding a community that's right for you. Because I think the more you try, the more possibilities you have on finding people that fit with you. Great. Kavya, did I say that right? Or... Kavya. Kavya, Kavya, I will, Kavya. Okay, I just wanted to say, I think the biggest thing is just being aware of like the many resources UCLA has. And I think that's something, even a lot of students who've been here like for four years, like will just be surprised being like, oh, I didn't know like this was there. I didn't know that was there. So there are a lot of resources like on campus um, by the administration, by students. And I think like it's just a really good idea just to like take some time to really find all of those like resources and to like actually use them like go to the counselors and like go to the administration and like make use of like the many different things that UCLA does have to offer as like one of the largest like and like the research institution and being such a large school like there are so many opportunities that other people don't have and just really make use of them. Great. Do we have any other panelists who would love to speak? We would love to hear your answers about any advice you would give for incoming transfers about starting the journey here at UCLA.
Okay, well, if we don't have any other answers, we do have about a few minutes of time. So I, I guess we can open the questions up to the, our participants. Um, if you guys want to raise your hand to be called on and speak if you have any particular questions about any of the orgs from the, um, the um, panelists that they're representing. So again, if you won't have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And then again, for any participants who came late, please peep Carlos's message about filling out the pre-survey. That is super important for data purposes when we're trying to make this program bigger and better for next year. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yes, yes. So I was just thinking, I know that you guys are talking about, you know, all the programs at UCLA and wellness and exercise and consent and all that. Um, I am living up in Northern California at the moment. And I was just even thinking, because everyone's just scattered, right? You're either in Northern California, you're in LA or you're in another state or another country. Is there no way to do a cohort for you know that particular region that maybe isn't connected directly with ucla for liability reasons right because if someone gets sick in the cohort then you don't want ucla to get sued but like for example having like a northern california wellness and exercise cohort that is sort of loosely associated with ucla and maybe uses some of the resources that are available through the clubs that just spoke at this event Does that make sense or? So to clarify, are you looking for like a quarantine family or? Almost, yeah, kind of something like, you know, cause we always talk about how it's so isolating and you know, the quarantine, oh, well, we can always meet online. And I absolutely agree. I mean, of course we've got to keep safe and we got to follow, you know, everything that we need to do. I, yeah. The thing is like, I was thinking why not create, and I'm not saying any of you have to do this, I, I can do this independently, create a cohort, again, that is not associated directly with UCLA, that would kind of encompass everything that has to do with wellness and exercise, right? Like going out for socially distanced runs together, or even, for example, meeting with one of you guys from one of the clubs and talking about, hey, you know what, like, how are we feeling today? Or, you know, stuff like that, small kind of group things. And you could say, like I was saying, like you could have Northern California cohort. You could have the Southern California cohort. You could have, I don't know, Idaho cohort, wherever people are and make little groups that are, you know, autonomous, but are kind of just loosely using the resources that are available at UCLA because what we have in common is we're students, right? So is that, ever been i mean not that that's ever been an idea because the pandemic just happened right now but is that something that you guys would be open towards i i've i've definitely as like a i'm an athlete so i see a lot of people and i i know a lot of other athletes sort yeah. of who participate and stuff like that so like i know on campus you know there's a lot of groups right now that do exactly what you're talking about like socially distance running meetups and things like that like um the biggest one that we have is called the no Vever project I want to say is what it's called and they just they run every day um, I think if you're looking for finding someone like that independently of UCLA um, where people would usually go for that is the Facebook page of like your class of whatever um, I'm pretty sure that's like where if you you know if you have to if you want to like reach out into the darkness of like if there is there anyone else in NorCal who's yeah. interested in this sort of thing that's what people do and that's also where people will go to find that stuff as well right. yeah I'll probably just see that then Thank you. 
Okay, we are now approaching the end of our session. I just want to say a last thank you to all of our panelists who were able to make it out today and represent their respective orgs. This information was super helpful and I'm sure that our participants learned a thing or two about more student wellness and opportunities and things that they can get involved in and participate here at UCLA. So thank you all again for making it out today. Also want to say a shout out to our participants for also coming out today and supporting us. And we're hoping that um, information you learned today is going to be helpful starting your journey here today. Mm -hmm. And um, to all the participants, there is another uh, workshop coming up. So please feel free to attend that. <clears throat> yes. Yes, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, as well as you really just reiterating what Vicente just said, we are having our imposter syndrome workshop. I know that we sort of touched base on it. So if you have any more questions about that, feel free to join that. Um, it is at two o'clock, so it's really soon. And yeah, I hope that some of y'all will be there. Oh, and thank you to all the uh, orgs that came. A big, big thank you. You made this event amazing. Yeah. This, this, this one, yeah. this panel amazing. Yeah, huge shout out to Christina and all of the SWC committee.